We've spent the last several weeks talking in detail about the suffering and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ from Mark chapter 15. And we're going to visit that one more time today, the crucifixion that is. And in Mark 15 and 38, we read that when Jesus died after he breathed his last, the curtain in the temple was torn in half from the top to the bottom. That's fairly significant. That sounds like something's changing to me. That something is done. That it's finished. And then in John 19 and 30, before Jesus died, one of the last things that he said on the cross was, it is finished. That sounds like something has been accomplished to me. And, and that has got me thinking. Oh, I've been meditating on this for the last several weeks, and um, I want to know what that is. I want to know what the curtain being torn in half means to us and, and what change took place in that moment. And so as we begin to think again about the crucifixion and all that it accomplished, are there more things than just theological outcomes? We, we tend to use fancy words to describe things like that, like atonement. We've talked about atonement in the last couple of weeks and redemption and, and those kinds of things, propitiation and substitution and all of those words that we use that are theological concepts to try to explain to us and encapsulate the doctrine of what happened on the cross. But when I come to the curtain in the temple being torn in half, I think there's something more going on there than just theological outcomes. That, that somewhere along the line, what Jesus did on the cross has to impact our every day. It impacts the way that we relate to God, not just our theology about God. Does that make sense? It, it impacts our relationship with and to God, not just the things that we understand about His nature and about His revelation to us. And so that being said, I want to suggest to you that there are more pragmatic, everyday consequences to the crucifixion, not minimizing what Jesus did in salvation and in death, not minimizing those theological outcomes at all, but simply focusing upon the pragmatic, everyday consequences to the crucifixion. One of the reasons that I'm here in this particular place in my life and even in my study is this little book that... Um, I gave this book out my first year as a pastor, and that, that's been 15 years ago now. I hate to even admit that. Um, this is a book by John Piper, and uh, it, they've since changed the, uh, the cover and the title, but th it, this one is titled The Passion of Jesus Christ, and it, you'll now find it as 50 Reasons Why Jesus Came to Die. And I've read this book through three times, a chapter each day in my morning devotions this year, and um, just meditating on all of the different facets of why Jesus came to die. And so some of what you're going to hear today has been influenced by this book. I've shared that book with some of you, uh, just to meet a need in your life and whatever, but, but for now, let's begin to focus as a body on the everyday consequences of the crucifixion. So where does the rubber meet the road? We look at the passage in Mark chapter 15, and we understand that Jesus died, and we know that he died for our sins. We know that he died to redeem us to himself, to provide us forgiveness, to give us access by grace into his mercy. But Where does that meet the road? And I think that's really where all of us struggle. We understand the concepts, but it's the practicality of it that we need, we need that renewed in our lives this morning. And so, um, let's just jump right into it. Can we do that? Um, focusing on what 
happened in Mark 15, 38, that the curtain of the temple was torn in half from top to bottom. We'll come back and revisit that in a moment, but I want to cover some scripture. I'm going to throw a lot of verses at you along the way, so each point will have verses that will go along with it, a little different style of message this morning. But nonetheless, the first major thing that we need to wrap our minds around that was accomplished on the cross that should impact us in our daily lives is this. Number one, when Jesus died, it disarmed our spiritual enemy. His name is the devil. You know who he is, right? And I'm not talking about, you know, red forked, you know, tail, pitchfork, that kind of stuff. You know, that's a, that's a comic illustration of a real spiritual enemy that poses a grave threat to our uh, standing with Christ and our uh, relationship to him, rather. So, if Jesus died on the cross to forgive us of our sins, one of the outcomes of that in our daily lives is that our enemy has been disarmed. He has no power over you. Right? So, here's some verses for you. In Colossians chapter 2, specifically in verse 15, the Bible says that God disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to an open shame by triumphing over them in Christ. And when we read those words, when we read those words rulers and authorities, we should be thinking about demonic powers. We should be thinking about those spiritual forces of darkness that afflict the world, that oppress God's people. And we know from other passages of Scripture like Ephesians chapter 6, that we're not in combat, we're not in spiritual combat with flesh and blood. My war's not against people, but it's against those same spiritual forces, against rulers, against those same authorities, against the cosmic power over this present darkness, against those spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. We are in a spiritual war. We forget that sometimes. And we especially forget that our enemy has been disarmed. But on the cross, here's what God did in Christ's death on the cross. Jesus exposed them, and he publicly disgraced them. That's what the Bible says in Colossians chapter 2. That on the cross, when Jesus died, he, was, he stripped our enemy and, and those spiritual forces of their power through the brutal humiliation of his death. He publicly disgraced them. Once and for all, he has brought to naught the work of the accuser. That the devil has no power. That he has been defeated and his power has been stripped from him through Christ's death on the cross. That is an amazing truth. And so as we go out into the world, we have no need to isolate ourselves. We have nothing to fear. If God be for us, who can be against us? Right? That no weapon forged against you, formed against you, spiritual or otherwise, will prevail against you because God is for you. And look, that's not prosperity gospel either. I know sometimes the alarm bells start going off and we start talking about the victory that we have in Jesus. We're worried about the ramifications of that concerning the prosperity gospel. But you hear me. God has triumphed over the devil in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The devil has no power over you. He has been disarmed and disgraced and stripped of his power. Hallelujah. That has an impact of the way that we live. Right? Because in Hebrews 2 and 14, that means that in Christ's death, he has also stripped the devil of his one weapon that is so powerful, and that is fear. Specifically, the fear of death. It, because Christ died and rose from the grave, it, it, the devil can't even use his one weapon against you anymore. That we have nothing to fear in death. Did you know that? That's what Paul was talking about in Philippians chapter 1 when he said, for me, to die is gain. To depart and to be with Christ is far better there's no fear in death it's what we live our lives for right are you with me this morning you'll need another cup of coffee this ought to light your fire a little bit there's no fear in death 
because Christ has stripped the devil of his power. And that weapon cannot be used against us anymore. It's good news. Amen? And that's the first practical consequence that I want to share with you this morning about the cross of Christ. Number two, it secured our sanctification. Now, I, you know, time out, preacher. Sanctification sounds kind of theological to me. You know, you said this was going to be practical, not theological, but hear, please hear me on this. If we understand sanctification, sanctification is where the life-changing power of God's word intersects our daily lives and makes us more like Jesus. That's pretty practical to me. Sanctification may be the most practical of all theological concepts. And so if we understand what the scripture is saying to us, specifically in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10 and 14, we who have faith in Christ have been sanctified through the offering of his body once and for all. That, that Christ has sanctified us, and it was through this single offering that he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Now, if sanctification is where the life-changing power of God's word intersects our lives and begins to make us more holy and make us more like Jesus, if I understand those verses, that ver those verses are saying something to us about us now and also about our future. When it comes to sanctification, we are imperfect and we are in process. That we have been declared holy in Christ Jesus, that we have been justified, there's another theological concept for you, but we have been declared innocent through the blood of Christ, yet, I don't know about you, but when I look at myself in the mirror, I don't see somebody who is holy. When you look at me, you don't see somebody very holy, do you? It's okay when I look at you, I don't see somebody very holy either. But the fact of the matter is, is that we're imperfect and we're in process. And so, though we're declared to be holy through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we are not yet fully holy here and now, are we? And so, what does that mean? It means that we are on our way. It means that we have not yet arrived and the evidence that our sanctification will be complete is not perfection in the here and now, but progress in the here and now. Progress is proof that he will bring our sanctification to its full and desired end. You know what that means? That means that if you are in Christ, you are not yet what you should be, that there's a gap. And, and, and that gap is pretty big in my life of, of, of where I am right now and who I know God wants me to be, who I should be, and who all of the things that the Scripture set out for me concerning fruitfulness and righteousness in Christ. There's a reality gap between where I am right now and where I know God wants me to be. Yet, where I, what, that gap is evidence that God will bring it to its full end, God, because I am in Christ, is able to keep me from stumbling so that he can present me blameless before his throne in the presence of his glory. That's his chief and desired end in my life. And you know what? If there's a gap in your life, you're in good company. Because he who has called you is faithful. He will surely do it. He will finish the work that he has begun in you until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so it's, it's one of the practical realities of the cross is that because e even though we are in Christ, and that, that, not to minimize that at all or to do it any kind of injustice, we are in Christ and we are declared to be innocent and holy and righteous through his shed blood, we have not yet arrived we are in progress, that, that we are people who are sanctified, yet we are also being sanctified. We are in progress, and that progress is proof that God will bring it to its full and desired end, and we ought to be thankful for that. Christ secured that for us in his cross. Amen? Number three, when we look to the cross, one of the practical consequences of the crucifixion is also revealed because there's no more condemnation 
He removed it. Praise the Lord. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. It's gone. And I realize that there's some overlap here, but please, please bear with me. Because we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Wrath has been absorbed by Christ on the cross. All of the wrath and punishment that we would spend an eternity in hell paying for was absorbed by Christ in three hours of darkness on the cross. All of it. And because of that, there is nothing left to condemn us. All of those things that separate us from God, all of those things that create enmity between us and God have been removed. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now what, what does that mean? What are we talking about here? That, that there is nothing left for the accuser to level against us. The devil has had his power removed, but yet even still there is nothing left for him to accuse us of. It has all been nailed to the cross. It is dead with him, buried with him in his tomb, covered in his blood. No condemnation remains. No charge can be leveled against you. Why is that? Because God justifies. There is no one who condemns us. According to Romans chapter 8, because Christ has died and has raised and is even now at the right hand of God, that he is interceding for us right now. And, and, and in my mind, here's how I work that out to mean. What, the, what does that mean right now, that Christ is interceding for me? It means that every time I am myself and my fallen nature surfaces and my flesh wins, that Christ claims me as his own. That he reminds me through the Spirit's power and he testifies before the Father in his presence and glory that I belong to him. That's what that means. And he does the same for you. That he claims you as his own even though we are imperfect and in process. Even though we make mistakes and we fail that Christ still claims us as his own in the very presence of his Father. I thought I'd get a hallelujah out of that one. That is an awesome truth, loved ones. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God who justifies. Christ is the one who would stand and testify against us, but instead... He claims us as his own, interceding for us on behalf of the Father. Now, let me tell you what else that means practically. It also means that there is no double jeopardy in God's courtroom. That, that we can't be tried and condemned twice for the same sins. Chew on that one for a little while. I don't know about you, but that, that, that causes a, a great swelling of emotion in my heart and in my spirit. That there's no double jeopardy. Thank you, Jesus. Christ died once and for all. We will not be condemned when we stand before him. We will be called into account. Our works will be tried so as by fire, but there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Hello? Condemnation is gone. You know why? Because it already happened on the cross. God condemned Christ in your place and in mine so that we could stand justified in his presence. Condemnation has already happened, so there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus. Amen. That means that God has set us free from guilt and shame. And you know, it's funny. 
Because if you're like me, I feel guilty about things that Christ has forgiven me of. That I, I bring them up again. That he's buried them under the depths of the sea and separated them as far from me as the east is from the west. And yet, I remember them. And I feel guilty over them. And I still feel shame because of them. But there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Remember that, loved ones. That if you are in Christ, if you are in Christ, your condemnation was absorbed by Christ on the cross and no condemnation remains because it's already happened. Praise the Lord. Amen? Number four, looking again to the cross and wondering what the practical consequences of Jesus' death are, kind of in parallel with what we just talked about, it cleansed our conscience. That, that our conscience is cleansed. What is the conscience? The conscience is that faculty of the soul that distinguishes between right and wrong. It is our inner moral witness and self-awareness. That it, it distinguishes between right and wrong. Our conscience tells us that what we are doing is right or it condemns us when what we are doing is wrong. Now we can sear our conscience and our conscience become, can become less sensitive. But if I understand what Christ did on the cross, Christ cleansed our conscience. He wiped the slate clean, if you will. Now let's, let's walk this through. Let's go back to the Old Testament for a minute. At one time, God allowed animal sacrifices to ceremonially cleanse the uncleanness of the flesh. That, that the blood of bulls and goats that was spilled and then the, the, their flesh was burned upon the altar and that blood was sprinkled upon the mercy seat, that God allowed that to cleanse the uncleanness of our flesh. But do you know, according to the writer of Hebrews, it never not once did it cleanse the conscience of the worshiper. That it that never cleansed us morally. It cleansed us physically, but not morally if that makes any sense. No animal blood could cleanse the conscience. Those sacrifices were types and figures of what would come through the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus' death upon the cross, the death that he would die once and for all. And so when we look to the conscience and its need to be cleansed, here we are in this modern age, free from animal sacrifices, but yet our problem is fundamentally the same. That our conscience still rises up against us and condemns us. It is defiled. Our conscience is defiled. And the only cleansing agent that can give the conscience peace in life and in death is the blood of Jesus Christ, that which he shed upon his cross. We can, we can do all manner of things to try to cleanse our conscience. People are funny about that way. It's one of the reasons why there are so many religions in the world is because people pull all of these things into their own power, put them in their own grasp in an effort to try to cleanse their conscience before God. They've even redefined their versions of God to try to remove that, that sense of defilement that rises up in their own conscience. That, that we can... Pay the ultimate sacrifice, as Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 13, and give our bodies to be burned. But unless we are in a loving relationship with God, it doesn't matter that we can give our lives away and spend our fortunes and sacrifice for the poor, and it doesn't matter that we can cut ourselves and brutalize our own bodies. That we can do all manner of things, trying to be good enough, but our problem remains. Our conscience is defiled, and the only remedy for a dirty conscience is the blood that Jesus shed in his death. It's the only thing that cleanses. Hebrews 9 and 14, it is the blood of Christ 
who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God that purifies our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Those dead works are not just the works of the law that were meant to cleanse us ceremonially, but they're our own efforts to try to cleanse our own conscience before God. All of those self-righteous things that we would do to try to make us feel better about ourselves, that Jesus Christ in his death upon the cross cleanses us from those dead works, purifies our conscience through his shed blood. It's the only remedy that God offers for a defiled conscience. Now, as I said a moment ago, I realize there's some overlap here with that sense of guilt and shame. But our conscience needs to be cleared. Because if our conscience has been defiled, and our conscience then is seared, and we're unable to determine what is right and what is wrong, that our hearts have been hardened to the Spirit of God and His influence in our lives, that conscience needs to be cleansed. That the Spirit of God needs to do a work in our heart and in our lives through the shed blood of Jesus Christ to make our conscience sensitive again. Right? That we will not only be discerning, understanding what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil, but we'll be able to listen to the Word of God, sensitive to the leading of the Spirit of God, as He testifies to us about Jesus, as He convicts us in this world about sin and righteousness and judgment to come. We need that. Do we not? need that so there's some practical application here when the in the cross of jesus christ god cleanses our conscience let's move on to number five because we need to hurry through these remaining ones when we look to the cross and its practical application we also see that it granted us freedom we're free and now let me explain that to you because all of us in this room are american citizens and we think we're free because we're Americans. I'm not talking about the freedom that you have because of the Constitution of the United States and your rights as a citizen of this country. We're talking about a different freedom here. That Jesus, because he loves us, Revelation 1 and 5, he has freed us from our sins by his blood. So all of those things that are in our flesh, that are part of our fallen nature, that he has freed us from. That, that we are free in Christ, Romans 8, 2, from the law of sin and death. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And so we must not submit again to that yoke of slavery. So here's, here's what that means. If, that we, if we are free from our sins, free from the law of sin and death, if it, is, if it is for freedom that Christ has set us free, here's what that means. It means that our old self has been crucified with him. So we're looking to the cross, looking at his death, and when we see his death there, we must understand that if we are in Christ, our old self has also been crucified with him there. That we have died with him on his cross so that the body of sin might be destroyed so that we can be no longer enslaved to sin. This is Romans 6, 6 through 7. The death of Christ and the death of self yield freedom from sin. So how do we live as free people? Because it, it, it's not because we're, we have constitutional rights. It's not life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. That's not how we live as free people. How do we live as free people, Christ having set us free from the body of death, from the law of sin and death? How do we live as free people? If it is not to first put our affections on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, that our affections are there, our treasures are there, our lives are hidden with Christ in God, and so therefore we put to death what is earthly in us so that we can become more Christ-like. Sin has no foothold. It has no power. 
And we're not yielding to it. And you know, you know what Paul said in Romans chapter 5 and chapter 6, that you are slaves to whatever or whomever you obey. That if you, if you yield yourself to Christ to obey him and his word, then you would become servants of righteousness. But if you continue to yield yourself to the law and to sin, you are slaves of sin and the flesh. You've never been set free. You're not a child. Right? Listen to me. We are, we are set free, but that doesn't mean we are masterless. We are not free so that we can become autonomous. We are not law unto ourselves. That's anarchy. That's hedonism. And really, if you want to drill down on it, that's Satanism at its core. To be a law unto yourself. We are not free to be a law unto ourselves. No, rather, we are free from sin so that we can yield ourselves to God to become servants of righteousness. Romans 6, 20 through 22. You've been set free from sin so that you can become a servant of Christ. Amen? We are not masterless. We are free to serve Him. And that is an awesome reality when you consider it. All of those religious things that, that took place in the Old Testament under that economy and dispensation of God, they were bound to a law, to a religious system that spoke of death. But in Christ Jesus, we have been set free from that. And we can now serve him with a clear conscience because there is no condemnation. That we're not worried about checking boxes anymore and making sure that we're ceremonial clean. Christ took care of that once and for all on the cross. That now because of grace... We have access and we are free to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. That's an awesome truth, isn't it, loved ones? We're free. Let's move on to number six quickly. I've already hinted at this, but the sixth practical application of the crucifixion is that it guaranteed our access to God. And, and this is where we circle back around to Mark 15 and verse 38 when the that that curtain in the temple was torn in half. What did that mean? Because I want to set the stage for you, because Mark mentions that, but this, this signaled something. This was Passover week, mind you. When all of this happened, Jesus died at the culmination of Passover week. So there were literally millions of Jewish pilgrims that had assembled in Jerusalem for this religious festival, and that there would have been Thousands of people gathered in the temple at this moment when this happened to sacrifice their lamb as Passover, that, that the blood would have run full and thick down the temple mount into the valley of the brook Kidron below, that, that, that there would have been literally thousands of people that have, would have witnessed this curtain ripping in half. And so what did it mean? It meant that the Old Testament sacrificial system and all of its trappings were over. That, that God, miraculously, through that curtain ripping in half, signaled that that era had dramatically come to an end. For nearly 1,500 years, only the high priest was allowed behind that curtain, and only one time a year. Everything about that curtain, everything about that sacrificial system said, you are unholy, and God is holy, so stay back and stay away. You cannot come near. And so this curtain was a physical barrier keeping people away from God and a perpetual reminder to every worshiper that entered the temple that they had to stay back. They were separated from God. In Herod's temple, Herod had remodeled the temple. It was, had started... Uh, before Christ was born and would, would still be going on, his, his remodel construction of the temple when it was destroyed in 70 A.D., this curtain was 60 feet long and 30 feet high and four feet thick. That, that if you look back, all the way back to the construction of the tabernacle, the plans that Moses were given, this curtain had to be so thick 
that when it was stretched between a, a team of mules, sunlight could not show through it. And so over the years, every time the temple was destroyed and rebuilt, the four times that that happened, and this time as it is remodeled by Herod, that curtain was expanded and thickened, if you will, again reminding people that they could not draw near to God under this system. But when Christ died, something that a team of horses could not stretch taut enough to let sunlight through was miraculously torn in half. And that barrier between people and God was permanently, as it was miraculously, removed. That God tore down that which separated through the death of his son. And by the way, just in case you've forgotten, all of those Passover worshipers would have been witness to this. They would have heard it rip. They would have seen it with their own eyes and heard it with their ears. And it would have been a reminder that God had completed that era in the Old Testament and something new had happened, something new was ushered in, and people now had access to God through Christ. That means to us who are in grace, the way to fellowship with God is not established by works of the law, but through the death of Christ. That, that we not only have a right standing before God in Christ, but we have a relationship with God in Christ that we can draw near. Access to God's presence has been guaranteed and I say it that way on purpose. It's not limited. It's full. It's guaranteed. Open through the completed work of Christ on the cross. We can draw near to the throne of grace, Hebrews 4.16, to find mercy and help in our time of need. Anytime you need God, you can go directly to him. You don't have to go through me. Aren't you glad for that? You don't have to go through a priest. You don't have to come with an offering, an animal that had to have its throat slit and its blood caught in a cup and then poured out upon the altar and then its flesh burned upon the altar of fire. You don't have to do any of that. You can go directly to God because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. We have guaranteed access to God the Father. Oh, that, what a privilege that is. Amen? And a very practical one at that. Well, we've now come to number seven. I know you didn't think I could get through seven points in, an, in, in a timely fashion. Somebody just said, yes. Yeah. But I did it, so there. <laughs> the last thing that I want to cover with you in the, in the last practical application, and as I, sa and I, I said earlier, there are many more. John Piper wrote a book of 50 of them. But I just want to share with you seven, and, and, and it's this one. When, when we look at the cross, we need to understand that it ensures our fruitfulness. That the last practical consequence of the cross I want to share with you this morning is that our fruitfulness in Christ is ensured. That Jesus said in John chapter 15, by this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. He said that in verse 8. And then in verse 16, he went on to say, you did not cho choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain or abide or should live on that it's eternal fruit, fruit that stands the test of time. So what are we talking about here when we're talking about fruitfulness? We're talking about Christ-honoring conduct, according to 1 Peter 2 and 12. According to Philippians 1 11, we're talking about the fruit of righteousness that comes by faith in Jesus Christ. And then we're all familiar with Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, where the fruit of the Holy Spirit's work is described for us as love and joy and peace and kindness and goodness 
and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. But I fear that when we read those, we're, st- we're still maybe talking about things that we think are somewhat ethereal. I can assure you that that is very much practical. That, and, and here's what I mean by that. When, when Christ ensures our fruitfulness, he is ensuring that we will leave dead works, those works of self-righteousness behind, that he will, he's ensuring that we, the, that we are leaving the, the works of the flesh, those things that cause condemnation and guilt behind, that, that we put those things to death, that we put to death what is earthly in us, and then the Holy Spirit has his perfect work in us to desire to do the will of God, and then we begin to work in the power of the Holy Spirit, Christ living his life through us. One thing I know to be true about myself, and therefore I assume it to be true about you, is that I cannot love people the way that Christ loves people apart from Christ's help. That I can be nice, sinners can be nice, even the the most evil people on the planet can be nice to people who are nice to them. We don't need God's help to be nice. We need God's help to love our neighbor as ourself. I need God's help to love people sacrificially like Jesus loves me. And as I look down that list of the fruit that the Holy Spirit produces in our lives, I realize that I need God's help in every single one of those things. I can be happy apart from God's help, but I cannot know lasting joy. Because my ultimate joy is found in Him and nowhere else that it is impossible to have peace. That there are times when I know tranquility, the absence of conflict in my life, when things seem to be going pretty smoothly. But that doesn't mean you have peace with God, and it certainly doesn't mean you'll have peace in death. That that only comes through the Holy Spirit's work in you, right? And for goodness sake, we can't be patient. There is no way I can be patient without the Holy Spirit's help. Hallelujah. (laughs) Any other witnesses out there? We could go on and on. But we understand, when we begin to boil this down, what what I want you to know is this. Good works or deeds like these that we're talking about are not the foundation of our acceptance before God. Christ is the foundation of our acceptance before God. They produce. The foundation then, or our root, if we follow that metaphor in John chapter 15, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches, that that Christ is the foundation for our acceptance before God, but then he is also the source of our good works, that he produces them in us. That is why it is called fruit. We are branches that remain in the vine, and therefore we are fruitful, okay? And so understanding this big picture, Christ didn't go to the cross because we presented him with some offering that he deemed acceptable. Rather, Jesus went to the cross, according to Titus 2 and 14, to purify for himself a people who were zealous for good works. That we are desirous to produce fruit because we are in Christ. Because he died for us, redeemed us to himself, and now Because we have died to sin, we are alive in Christ. He is living his life in us. So we are zealous for good works. Desirous of them. We want to be fruitful. We want to have lasting joy. You ought to desire that. Right? Like like zealously, jealously desire that. I want eternal joy in my life. I don't want fleeting joy. I don't want joy that comes from from sex or from food or from having more money. I want lasting joy that comes from my relationship with Jesus Christ because I am completely satisfied in Him. That's what I want. I'm, I'm jealous over that. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in me and that's the work of the Holy Spirit in you. And that 
that I jealously want to, to love people like I love myself. And every time I do something that is self-loving, it, it ought to be a reminder to us through the Holy Spirit that we ought to be loving others in the same way. That we ought to be loving others the same way that we are loving ourselves. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in us. We ought to be desirous of that. In the same way we can work down the list of the fruits of the Spirit in our lives. And so what is the sum of these practical implications of the cross? We realize that we are people in progress. We have not yet arrived. But nonetheless, these are things that Christ purchased for us and has given to us in his cross. They are decisively ours because he has given them to us. It, that Christ has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And so we see that wrapped up here. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. What he did, he did once and for all. It is finished. Nothing can be added to it. Nothing can be taken away from it. It was his initiative in the first place, and it was his alone. And so we are saved by God's grace alone, by faith alone, in Jesus alone. Amen? And so I believe what God is calling us to do today as we look to the sum of all of this is to rejoice in Christ, to look to him as the author and the finisher of our faith and follow in his steps that we be completely satisfied in what he has done for us because it is finished. What he did, he did once and for all. Don't need to do anything else. We simply need to live in him. Amen? So let's stand to our feet. Fawn's going to sing through. Uh, uh, so Actually, we've prepared a special song for you this morning at, by way of invitation. Um, Fawn and Ronnie are going to sing this song. Um, let's pray, and we're going to open up the altar. If you need to come and pray at the altar, you can during the song. The prayer room is going to be open. Brother Dwayne Bagwell is in the prayer room this morning. That's going to be open for you after the service if you need private prayer. But as we stand together, let's pray, and then we'll be seated. And I want you to listen to the song. When the song's over, you can be dismissed. But let's just rejoice in Christ as we listen to the words of the song. Can we do that? Pray with me. Father, the fact that we are able to come before you even now has been guaranteed for us by Jesus Christ on the cross and we rejoice in that privilege and that honor. May our minds more completely wrap themselves around all that you accomplished for us on the cross. And, and then it's not just a theology, but a lifestyle. That it's something that impacts the way that we live every day. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd give us a more perfect understanding of that, a more complete understanding of that, and, and also that we could rejoice in the Son so that we can make much of Jesus and glorify him in our hearts this morning. And as we listen to this song, may we rejoice in you, Lord. Thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you for making us alive together in Christ Jesus. Thank you for the blessing that that is. And if there is someone here that has not put their faith in Jesus alone for their salvation... May they do that this morning. May they let go of all of the things that they're hanging on to. And may they turn to Christ completely and trust in him alone. As Fawn and Ronnie sing this song, we rejoice in you, Lord Jesus. You are worthy. Amen. You may be seated as we sing this song together. <laughs>